and you might want to put this little chunk at the beginning because if we put this on the tubes, um, internet commandos aren't going to watch us to the end and they're going to chime in, you know, with their, with their two cents. I am scratching the surface here. I am talking layman's terms, man. Yeah. This is what I'm talking about. Layman's terms. I'm scratching the surface of what I have. Yeah. Scratching the surface. So yeah, just, uh, have another big old glass of shut the up. <laughs> Yeah, we, we did this, this. The video is not for these professional survivalists. Right. Yes. Right. Bingo. It's yeah. not. What are the most important steps in preparing a home for a potential natural disaster? I just want to start by because I start every time like this. Number one, I am not paranoid. I'm, I just like to be prepared. Say um, that again, because I, people still say you're paranoid. Right. Yep. I am not paranoid. I enjoy life. I am very happy. You know, I am at peace. It's this is a uh, it's a labor of love and it's all about peace of mind when it comes right. to prepping. And it, it's a la it becomes a labor of love. Are you going to need to prep? Maybe not. <laughs> but, you know, in this area, coat right? So uh, eastern coast of U USA, we're susceptible to hurricanes and stuff like that. Some of the power grids are somewhat obsolete and power goes down frequently you know because the the grid is is just a little bit antiquated and i've been doing this for a long time and i've been sending out psas to people for a long 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 time this isn't something i started to do yesterday or in 2020 so first and foremost not paranoid just prepared i don't want to get caught with my pants down and it man this has saved my ass so many times so uh, most important step in preparing home for potential natural disaster. So that's what we're talking about right now. Natural disaster. Keep that in mind. Number one, don't be prepared tomorrow. <laughs> be prepared yesterday. Yesterday. Get it going right now. Right now. And you start small with this stuff, right? Now, granted, we don't. We all have different homes. We all have different, it, it, people don't. You know, some people live off grid, and they say, "Oh, well, you don't have enough stuff." I live off grid and my house is, yeah, but w not all of us have that luxury, bro. Some people live in apartments. What are they supposed yeah. to do? So right. you just shut up over there. Yes, <laughs> I got it. You're a mega prepper. Yeah. The rest of us don't have that luxury. So number one, be prepared yesterday, not tomorrow, right? So start building stuff and then you just think about it on your own. What will I need? Let's say for just three days, right? Three days. And then you want stuff that's accessible. You know, you want it easily access to it so of course you know water and food right water and food water and food and it's fine people will say oh nope cases of water are no good hey once again a lot of people don't have the luxury to store 55 gallon drums of water or to collect water or have this massive storage uh unit where they could collect water so at least a several cases of water somewhere you know, yeah. stick it in the corner of the closet, whatever it is. Yes, water has a shelf life. You just you just cycle through them. And what, everybody says, what's a shelf life? Just look it up. But if you keep it in a cool, dark place, it's got a longer shelf life. You know, mine, I have water storage cans. So, you know, it, it's got years of shelf life, years of it. Do I need power? Do you need power? You know, and if so, what needs to be powered? So do you need a generator? Generator is a two-way or double-edged sword. Yeah. Uh, generator is good for short term because, you know, we have perishables and freezers and stuff like that. So we want to be able to, like the last power outage we had, that was six days. And I ran my generator for two hours a day, period. That was it. That was all I needed. In order to run a generator, you need gasoline. So you have to have some gas stored too. Because here's the deal. <laughs> and people don't get this, man. When the power's out, the gas ain't pumping. Right. You know, so... You got to have gas. As I've said before, the rule of thumb for my family, and we all have buy-in on this, is cars in the driveway are never below three-quarters of a tank. Cars right. in the driveway, never below three-quarters of a tank. We also had the pipeline sabotage two years ago, yeah. you know, the, the southeast here. So the gas gasoline was out for about a week as well, and people were stressing out, man. We didn't need, we didn't need any. We had ton, tons of it. I don't need to reiterate how much gas I've got stored, but all of my cars were three quarter, at least three quarters full in the driveway. Uh, you mentioned preparation for people like in apartments, et cetera. Right. You said there was a two edged sword with compressors. With, yes, with, with generators. With generators, yep. with generators right. a two edged sword right. with generators. So they may not be able to run a generator there. 
what right. what should they keep in mind? Well, one of the things I do, and it's it's uh it's just force of habit for me. With if I have empty freezer space, I just throw a gallon of water in that freezer space. So I've always got frozen water, so I could turn my refrigerator into a big gigantic cooler. Free, right. You know. Yeah. I mean, I've got in my garage freezer right now. I've got six bags of ice and one, two, three, four, five, uh, six gallons of water frozen. You know, which will keep my perishables if i if i didn't have a generator cool for several days because refrigerators stay cold for freezers stay cold you know when we had the uh the six day power outage yeah the big freezer in my garage in six days i ran the generator power to it two times one hour each time everything was mm. still frozen in it. yeah because yep. just frozen upon frozen <laughs> yeah with the yes, meats and everything it's all right? frozen in there yeah. it just stayed frozen but I went, well, let me just give it a boost, you yeah. know. Yep, two times in six days, one hour each time. Wow. And it kept everything frozen. Yep, That's I didn't great. need. Yep, but but they're double-edged sword because um, a lot of guys will run them and run them and run them, the generators. Yeah. Um, so, n- number one, you're, you're showing your wares. You're, you're right. telling other people, hey, I've got a generator. And they're susceptible to theft, you know, generators are. And people know how to steal that stuff. You know, in Florida, oh, a couple of years ago, big hurricane, there was this band of dudes with a pickup truck full of $10 lawnmowers. And at two in the morning, they'd listen for the generators, roll up the driveway, start up a lawnmower, turn off the generator, and then just walk away with the generator. So they're trading a $10 junk-ass lawnmower for a $1,000 generator. Uh, wow. And they just switched, they switched out with the lawnmowers. Yeah, there, folks in Florida have heard about this. I think it was 13 in one night, this one uh, LEO told me. <laughs> Generator stolen. Goodness gracious. Right. Okay, can you talk about the essential items that should be included in a home emergency kit? This is something that people don't often think about. Yeah, yeah. So in these you want accessible right now. So, you know, of course, one of the things we always think about is first aid. But mine is on my kitchen counter in a corner. Like so big first aid kit and an IFAC. It's right there on the kitchen counter. Because I don't want, if I need aid, I don't want somebody to have to go search for it. I could just say kitchen counter. Right. Go get it. Stop my bleeding. <laughs> right, yes. You know, it's right there. It's right, it's accessible. It's right there. Because a lot of people have first aid kits. It might be in their laundry room or stuffed under a sink or, you mm-hmm. know, whatever it is. Right. And they might forget about it. You know, it, it, because they haven't used it, because it hasn't, there hasn't been an emergency or even a cut finger, mm. you know, in such a long time. They're like, where is that first aid kit? Right. No, man. Yeah. Uh, um, invest in something better than the little one you're going to get at Ace Hardware. You know, invest in a good first aid kit and just leave it on the kitchen counter if you got space for it. It's right there. It's accessible. Another thing, you want lights at the ready. So power goes out, boom, right now. Where's your light? Where's your white light? How can you see? You want them at the, at, easily accessible. So I always have handheld light, white light in my bedroom, on my kitchen counter, in my dump shelf. Not everybody has that, you know, stuff. They don't have a bunch of handheld lights. Those Lucy lights, L-U-C-I, I have 10 of those and they're on top of my refrigerator. So they're, everybody knows where they are. The kids know where they are. Rebecca knows where they are. They're, everybody knows where they are. There's a light above them. So they're solar powered. They get, they get a charge on them. So they're right there. Have white light accessible. Another one, cash on hand, you know, cash mm-hmm. dollars. And these are small denominations. How much cash? I don't know. Just how about that? I'm just weighing it. Let's say $500. $500 in cash, fives, tens, twenties, that kind of thing. You know, have cash on hand because cash is still going to be relevant if it's short term power outage, natural disaster, that kind of thing. Cash value is going to, of course, diminish over time. Right. You know, and it's going right. to become worthless. But right. it, in the in the in the short term, cash is still king. Cash is still mm-hmm. going to be king. So have cash available. And then you know, people are thinking, well, I got guns. Yeah, your guns aren't doing you any good unless you have mags loaded. So you got to have some magazines loaded. Have magazines loaded. So there's a couple things right there. All right, what should our communication plan look like during a natural disaster or a power outage, especially if we get separated? All right, so the easiest answer first, if we still have 
cell phone coverage, use your cell phone. But your cell phone is going to be worthless and use, unless you have the ability to charge it. So I have several different ways to charge. I have, you know, jackeries, and then I have the small solar uh, panels where they just charge uh, small devices like that. Because if cell phone and towers in, are still up, and if you still got data and such, you could still send texts. But we have a set of uh, walkie-talkies, too. And they're good. You know, they're good handhelds, two-way radios. I got a set of four of them. But now you need to know, like, radio procedures. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and you have to practice proper radio procedures. You know, short, clear, concise. Communications followed by authentication. Don't hot mic the radio. In other words, don't just hold it down the whole time and him and haw. You know, when you have something to say, key it. You wait for a second, you start talking at the end of your communication, you say over and then unkey it, <laughs> Right. you know, and uh, when you're finished with the entire, with your communication, with the entire thing, you culminate it without, you yeah. know, so that way, whoever's at the receiving end knows, all right, that's the end of communication. Let me stop jibber jabbering. And then you have to know the range of those things too. And keep in mind that range varies with uh, handheld radios because uh, signal strength can be absorbed by uh, weather, by trees, by foliage, that kind of thing. So you want to test the parameters, those uh, handheld devices. And just, you know, don't ask me. Somebody's going to say, what's the best one to get? I don't know. The best one you research and buy. Yeah. Yeah, whatever's rated well. Yeah. So there's a couple right there. That was really good, Mac. Over. Mm -hmm. Over. <laughs> Roger that. Over and out. <laughs> okay, well, actually, that's interesting. What's the difference between Roger that, 10 fork, and copy? They're all they're all the same. It's all the same thing, right? Yep, all the same. Yep, affirmative. Affirmative. Roger that. Copy. 10 mm fork. Okay. Okay. <laughs> all right. How can we effectively store and manage food and water supplies during prolonged power outages? Now, you kind of talked about what you did at your how you did it yourself uh, with having the secondary refrigerator. Now it's not common for people to have necessarily a secondary. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I thought freezer. about that. Right. I thought about that. So, you know, dry storage is a, is a good one, right? So prepared meals, dehydrated meals in dry storage that have tons of shelf life. And a lot of them have like 25 years shelf life. It's yeah. ridiculous. You know, of course, in order to, to use those, you need water. So water, top of your list, water, water. We can't survive without water, folks. Right. Have water. That's number one. You know, you got to have water. Uh, water is going to be, you know, the hot commodity item. So you got to have that. You got to have some water. You got to, man, ha have water. Please just have water. And then, like I said before, you can have cases of water, but just remember they have a shelf life. But but water does. But you know what? I'm going to drink that anyway. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But it can get bacteria. It can get, uh, you know, if it's pl the plastic water bottles, it can be a little toxic if stored too long, that kind of thing. So just cycle those things out. I've got uh, a, like water storage jugs that are dark and they seal real tight. And I think when I, when I bought them originally, I think uh, the shelf life was uh, – for the water it said ah change it every and it was like man eh, change it every five years <laughs> something right. like that yeah right and then for me the other thing is rebecca and i will we prep food so we do a lot of canning we do canning we dehydrate we've made jerky so if you if all your you know if you got a if you do have that meat freezer and the electricity is out for a long time what are you going to do with all that meat <laughs> mm -hmm. I, and this is something i'm still researching you know being able to smoke that you know, yeah. smoke it all because I'm not going to be able to dehydrate it necessarily because I'm not going to have electricity. So I want to be able to smoke that, you know, jerk it on a smoker yeah. uh, and so I could preserve that meat. But we've got a lot, I mean, like a lot of food storage, a lot. Yeah. Food for a long time. And then the other thing that we have, uh, manage food and water supplies during prolonged power outages, we garden a lot. I mean, we've got so much food. And we're harvesting every day. And our garden is year-round. We garden year-round. So, you know, mid-Atlantic, you're, you're still in this area. You can still garden year-round. Just research your zone, which here is zone 7. So we can grow the broccolis, the kales, the uh, Brussels sprouts, the uh, collard greens in the winter, all that stuff in the winter time. Yeah. So there's a few for you right there. All right. 
How important is knowing first aid and other basic survival skills in situations of natural disasters or power outages? You know, think about this, folks. Think about that one for a second. So natural disasters or power outages, right? Natural disasters or power outages. Who is that affecting? It's not just affecting you. It's affecting everyone, right? Everyone. So communication is going down. Hospitals are probably overwhelmed. Ambulance services, EMS, EMTs, EMS systems, probably overwhelmed. And then what if you need something fixed? You know, what if you need something repaired? Right. Who is coming to assist? Probably no one. So mm -hmm. think about that and take that serious. So survival skills, you know, number one, the best way to get out of a bad situation, don't get there in the first place. So mitigate sure. risk. You know, when you, you want to think when you're in this type of situation now that you've got to mitigate risk. You can't just haphazardly do shit the way you would usually do it and think, well, if I get real jacked up, I can just go to the hospital and get fixed yeah. up. So I know that for me, I'm going to err on the side of caution even a little bit more. I don't want to get cut. I don't want to get scraped. I don't want to break a leg. Right. But it's important to have those med skills, being able to self-aid, fix yourself or somebody else and have stuff available. You know, have your gauzes available. Have your tourniquets available. Have all the little stuff, the band-aids and all that crap available. But it's very important. And then skills. You know, though not tangible, skills in a crisis situation or prolonged what I see, I'm just forecasting this one. I don't know because I've never been in a prolonged type of natural disaster. And I'm talking long, I'm talking more than six days. I'm right. talking a long time. Though not tangible, skills will become not only very important for your survival and comfort, but they become means of barter. You know, what do you know? And the more you know, the less you have to rely on other people to get you out of bad situations. So learn the basic skills. I always like to break survival down into an acronym, right? So size up the situation, undo haste makes waste, remember where you are, value, living, improvise, vanish fear and panic, act like the native, learn the basic skills. So survival in a nutshell. Yeah, man, learn the basic skills. And if you have like projects at home, just visit U U University of YouTube and start fixing your stuff yourself. I, I mean, yes, I am the basic dude stuff, dude, but I don't know all the basic dude stuff. A lot of stuff I, I go to on University of YouTube and figure it out and it's above my pay grade. I'm going to hire somebody right. to fix my stuff. But what I'm going to do, if the guy doesn't think I'm a pain in the ass, I'm going to say, hey, man, can I rubberneck? And, can, mm -hmm. you know, if I'm not, I don't want to be up your ass. And I don't want to interfere. I just want to, I, I want to absorb the knowledge, bro. You know? So if I have somebody come and fix something, I'm going to ask him. Yeah. Can I, can I rubberneck? Can I ask you a question here and there? Yeah. Right on. All right. Mm -hmm. What are the recommendations for managing heating and cooling during power outages in extreme Woo! weather conditions? So extreme weather conditions. So think about that people, you know? Now, a lot of homes, and here, here we go again, right? All, there's going to be people out there going, yeah, well, my house is freaking wired, and I got so much propane and blah, 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 natural gas and hama, hama. Well, not everybody has that, man. So you got to have at least a plan in place, you know, some kind of plan. One of the things I don't have yet, I'm still in the market for, is a wood-burning stove for the wintertime. Mm. Now, I have a gas fireplace, and I always keep my tank filled, and that's going to suffice for, suffice for a short period of time. But how warm do I need it? I don't need it freaking 70 degrees in my house in the winter. I just need it above freezing. You know, I just <laughs> need it above uncomfortable. That's all I need. Mm -hmm. And I'm also going to, like th this last winter when we had the power outage, you just close certain doors. You heat a certain part of your home, yeah. just a certain part of part of it. Um, so in, in lieu of my gas, let's say I ran out of gas, I still have a fireplace. I could take that insert out and I could still use that. And I've got wood. Now, the wood cutting becomes kind of a hobby. I do have a fire pit in the backyard, and I like to have fires in the winter. But it's very comforting also knowing that I got a big freaking gigantic pile of wood, and I just add to it periodically. I add to that pile of wood. Now, conversely, right? So think about this. Summertime, 95 degrees here in North mm -hmm. Cackalack. Yep. 95. Where are you going to sleep? Where are you going to sleep? Where are you going to sleep? Do people even think about that? In your mm -hmm. bedroom? Probably not, bro. <laughs> so it, it, Rebecca and I just had this conversation again uh, a couple of days ago. It was 
hot as shit. And I just upped my inventory. I got one more big, gigantic, um, rechargeable fan. Mm. You know, another fan. Because I wanted to be able to circulate mm. air. You know, and these fans are great. I could charge them on my Jackery. They, they run for a long time. You could hang them. They oscillate all this stuff. So we're going to sleep in our uh, screened in porch. Mm, yeah. We've talked about it in the past and, you know, it's, it's perfect. It's going to be a lot cooler than sleeping inside because we're not, there's no way you're going to be able to sleep inside. You're not going to be comfortable, you know, because it's 95 degrees outside and your house is cooking all day. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and it's probably hotter in the house, you know, once that AC is shut off for a few days. And, you know, a house is going to be real hard to circulate, you know, to get air pushed through and to, to, to get, get some of that hot air out of there. So just think of that contingency plan. You know, if you got a porch or something, you know, the dogs could stay out there with us. They'll be perfectly comfortable. And I'll have mm -hmm. three fans going in there. You know, yeah. and it'll just it'll just be a nice breeze all night. It'll push the hot air out, keep the air flowing, and we'll we'll be a little more comfortable than we would be sleeping inside. Yeah. I mean, third world countries do that, man. Nobody sleeps in their houses in 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 the summertime. They all sleep in their yards. Yeah. So just think about it, folks. How about that? Mm. All right. What role does mental preparedness play in surviving and recovering from natural disasters? Dude, so um, I think that has a massive role, right? Massive, you know, so the uh, mental preparedness for morale, mm. you know, you want the feeling of, to, of being invincible, like unaffected, unimpeded by the environment. I, I want to feel that way, you know, and I do feel that way. I am, uh, I am not going to be adversely affected to the point where it's going to diminish my morale or my spirits or anything like that because my morale is already high because I do this stuff. I prep and mental, you know, I have good mental preparedness because this is a way of life for me. This is yeah. something that I do all the time because you want to go into that with a, eh, it's no big deal type of attitude. You know, since Rebecca and I have been married, we've been tested a, a few times and we've always prepped, right? We've always prepped and we've had minor power outages here and there. So the first big test was uh, coronation. You know, it's March 17th, 2020. And then to add insult to injury, we had a five-day power outage here, right at the beginning of it, five days. We needed or wanting nothing from anybody or anything. We did not need anything. We were good to go. We weren't those douchebags scrambling <laughs> to the grocery store to get toilet paper. Right. We didn't need anything. And we started making our own beer too <laughs> because there was a, a couple businesses still opened. They weren't opened for public access, but they would sell stuff. So we just started making our own beer because the only thing we had to go to the grocery store for was booze. So we were like, hey, screw that, man. Let's start making our own beer right. too, which, you know, takes a process because you got to let beer grow because it's a living, breathing thing. Mm -hmm. So we had, you know, there's a learning curve there. But massive. Going into that with that no big deal attitude because the higher – your attitude, the higher your altitude. So it's, it's huge. You know, if in, in, like I said, this is something, it's a peace of mind thing, you know, building new skills, building a supply network and chain. It's, it's all peace of mind and it takes time. This takes time. This isn't something you do tomorrow, but start doing it tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> start, start, start now, you know, start compiling stuff, start uh, collecting little things. And just think about your situation because the situation is going to be different for everybody depending geographically where you live and your skill level, the size of your property, all that stuff. It, it's, it's going to be different for everybody. So just think about it. You know, power is out. It's all gone. What do I need to do? What? And you want to think creature comforts too. What do I need to do? What do I need to have? Um, and what do I, what, what can I start prepping for right now? So that's a huge one. But the, the sooner you, pre you prepare, the sooner you start, the sooner that mental preparedness will start, uh, having an, a positive effect on your right. psyche. That's right. Very mm -hmm. good. <clears throat> All right. What are some lessons learned from past disasters that every homeowner should know? All right. I started this out with people don't learn lessons anymore. They don't learn lessons anymore. So just here, just here in this, in my neck of the woods or pub bantery, you know, right. 2020, everybody needed everything. Coronation, 
right? Everybody needed stuff. The next thing, gas lines went down. Everybody needed stuff again. They didn't learn. The next thing, six-day power outage. Same people, they still needed stuff. Mm -hmm. They needed toilet paper. They needed gas. You know, they, they, they were like, who's got a generator? Oh, my God. This is so novel that power went out. No, mm -hmm. it happens all the time. So people don't learn lessons anymore because we are devolving. We are devolving. <laughs> but let's say you do <laughs> because people are institutionalized. You know, it really, it, I mean, it doesn't tick me off. It the, the only reason it ticks me off is because I'm on the interwebs a lot and I have distributed these PSAs since, I don't know, how long have I been on the interwebs? Since 2013, I think it was. And I've been I've been discuss, have, having discussions about this stuff since then because I'm 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 still relative. I've only been on the interwebs for ten years, right. but I've been talking about it since then, and you know, and it's become cool now. Everybody else is talking about it, you know survival this and prep that, mm -hmm. and, you know, everybody's doing it now. Let me see. Yeah, so the people are institutionalized because they'll th they're going to think, well, the si system will fix itself, and it, uh, and the system once it gets up and running again will help me out. The system that's yeah. that's what that's I, that's the mindset of folks right now ah it'll get better yep and then you know oh thank god the electricity came back on and they will they'll, they'll do nothing to rectify the situation or to prepare themselves in the event that it does happen again i mean i just had to call a spade a spade on that one so <laughs> what are some lessons learned because I, I read that lessons learned people don't learn lessons <laughs> well well yeah i mean well in your case Right. And well, so, uh, so, so I think the, there's a better one for that. Let me see. The lesson learned is that people don't learn lessons, so you should right. learn your lesson. Well, I I saved my uh, lessons learned for the last one for number nine because it okay. kind of is the same thing. All right. Well, let me ask you that. So yeah. after after a disaster is passed, what should be our immediate steps in terms of assessing damage, ensuring safety, and beginning the recovery process? All right. So. <clears throat> This is a big one. You need to get into action right now, right, right now. So reevaluate, reorganize, resupply, refit right now. Do it right now. As soon as electricity comes back on, no goofing around because everybody's going, ah, oh, nope, I'm refilling my propane. I'm regassing everything. And then after the last power outage, Rebecca and I had a discussion. What were we lacking? You know, what were we lacking? And we really weren't lacking anything, but creature comforts was a big one. Yeah. And Another another one that was huge for morale for us, huge, and we had no idea it would be. So six days power outage in the wintertime, so it gets dark early. So big stack of firewood. Man, we made fires in the pit, fire pit, fire every night. And mm -hmm. we sat around that for entertainment and just chit-chatted, me, Rebecca, and the kiddos. And that was such a good morale boost, just sitting around that fire. Yeah. And we just let the fire smolder and just hang out. So that was a big one. That was a um, it was a lesson learned because I didn't anticipate that. I didn't have that firewood in anticipation for a power outage and then entertainment. That wasn't my plan with that, but it is now. Yeah, <laughs> I want that firewood there, especially if it happens in the winter again or when it's nice out where I could have that fire. Because talk about good entertainment, man. Sitting by that fire, it was so immediately because we burned like. I don't know, like three quarters of a quart of wood or something like that mm -hmm. in a fire pit. We were, we were raging, man. Yeah, right. So I had to immediately go out and get more firewood, you know, after that, immediately. But we didn't even use that much stuff like gasoline. I think we used one on the generator and everything else, one five-gallon can, and I still had uh, seven five-gallon cans remaining mm. in six days. Yep. Wow. So yeah, I have a lot of gasoline, but but to some people they were like, oh, that's not enough. Yeah, but for for an average dude, that's a lot, bro. That's more than anybody else in my street, more than likely. Mm -hmm. You know, eight can, eight five gallon cans. I guarantee you, that's more. Yeah. So we in the, in the fan was the the battery operated fans. Those were big, you yeah. know, having those. And then that's when we started thinking about because our home isn't equipped for it, but it'd be easy transition just to have that wood burning stove in, inside because those are so efficient. You don't need, uh, you, you need very little wood to make that thing rage and to heat up the house. Right. So we are definitely, because it, it's just going to sit there, but it's still going to look decorative. And it's, it, and that's in the interim, it, it's just going to be a decorative piece. Yeah. 
Yeah. And we might never use this wood burning stove, but I'm going to have it there because we're still going to have the fire, the, the gas fireplace. But mm-hmm. when gas is gone, I'm taking that insert out and running that stovepipe up the chimney right. and I have a wood burning fireplace. So, so we do chat about it. You know, we do a little AAR after action report after any type of event like that. Say, what were we missing? What were we lacking? What would be good to have? Right. I think there's a good, anyway, just good uh, little. So just as a, just as a recap, I mean, make sure again, food and water are going to be important. There are the, we've got, a ton of dehydrated food like you said it'll yep. last like a quarter century so right. have some of yes have something that for the long term type thing but there are things you can keep extra of that yep. you know for the three day outage type scenario make sure you've got water water is going to be impaired like you said we can go without food for a while not very long without water and water does ha- doesn't have a long shelf life in terms of years and years and years. But even if you're in an apartment or whatever, condominium, townhouse, you can rotate things out in terms of your water and keep yourself fit that way. Make sure you've got things like if you've got a baby or pets or whatever, you make sure you got extra for them as well. You mentioned the uh, what, what were those lights again? The um the Lucy Lucy lights Lucy lights so the little they're little they're like a little little uh little balloon little, little balloon inflatable. things yeah, inflatable things and they're solar powered and so they work fantastic they're at, yep. they're better than a candle um yep. so have plenty of those again all inexpensive things that you so you don't necessarily need a generator especially again if you're in a place where that's just not conducive make mm-hmm. sure that that your vehicle is always at three quarters of a tank make sure you've got light you might want to stock up on some batteries for said lights, handheld mm-hmm. lights, etc. But just just think through, as Mac was describing, the very basics of what life would be like. Try to imagine, use your imagination. Yeah, right. And, That's and, a big one. And picture what it would be like. Day one, you wake up, there's no power. Think about what do you normally do? Maybe you normally go to the bathroom. You're not mm-hmm. flushing the toilet. Right. Right. Yeah. And then you go, go downstairs. Well, see that. People, people will argue about that. They'll say, no, the water still runs. Yes, it does for uh, for a certain amount of time. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Sorry, well, I mean, ahead. if if like where I live, if that power is out, that power is out, mm-hmm. period. Yeah. So you, your toilet is not going to flush unless it has sufficient force mm-hmm. to do that. So, you know, if we know a storm is coming, we can fill bathtubs with water, grab the five-gallon buckets and dump them in the toilet and flush if that if it goes too long you're going to run out of water obviously so but just kind of go through your day you know what you would do and realize that all of those things that coffee maker is not working that toilet may not necessarily be working that sink may not come on etc etc so you got to think about your food you got to think about you know immediately go into effect what's your plan Mm -hmm. do you have a plan you know, do you know just where things are like Mac was talking about? But there's so much more. We didn't talk about like prepping for dogs. We yeah. didn't talk about. So one of the things is like creature comforts. I want to be able to make good coffee every day. Yes. That's a huge one. So I want to be able to grind my coffee. I want to be able to boil water and different means, whether it's, uh, you know, a French press or a, uh, you know, whatever kind of press you're using. I want to be able to have coffee every day. And for long term, I mean, I've even got in my prep, I've even got instant coffee in there. <laughs> I got a lot of it. <laughs> yeah. Well, so like, really? yeah, you come to my house, there'll be like one of those literal California wind turbines giant ones in my yard i said dude that's overkill that's just for coffee right that's just for just for coffee (laughs) just for coffee (laughs) (laughs) oh yeah 